Welcome to the 24th Miami Jewish Film Festival. My name is Shauna Sheldon. I'm executive director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in North Miami. I'm pleased to have a conversation with Max Bash and Malia Scharf about their film, Kenny Scharf, When Worlds Collide, that's premiering at this year's film festival. I'll start by introducing our guests. Malia is a producer, writer, actor, and first time director based in Brooklyn, New York. Her short film, Kenny Scharf, more, newer, better, nower, funner, screened at MoCA Los Angeles in 2011. Beyond filmmaking, her larger mission is to create spaces where artists bring education, healing, and art to communities. Max is a visual artist and director based in Brooklyn, New York. He graduated from Bard College with a degree in photography and philosophy, and has since focused his attentions on the art of cinema and its powers of conveyance. Beyond directing, he also works as a cinematographer and an editor. This is his feature film directorial debut. Thank you both for being here. Um, so I wanna hear from each of you, what, what inspired this film? Um, thank you. Yeah, so, well, what inspired the film for me, I just, I wanted to make a film about my, about Kenny and his story. Um, because I was very inspired by the community that he was a part of in New York. And I also, um, I think I really wanted to share a side uh, and a view of my father that I think um, the art world specifically maybe wasn't able to see. So my attempt, I think, you know, I, I began this film a long time ago, about over 10 years ago now. And so it was a combination of the inspiration of this fun, creative community and, and wanting to um, really show who I thought he was in his work and ways that maybe were harder to see in just uh, through his artwork at first. And then Max um, came on a few years ago and I'll let you <laughs> share about that. Yeah, no, I am, um, I'm Amelia. I guess like seven years ago, but then we didn't start working on this till probably, well, she, so I'd known that about the project. I'd known uh, she'd been carrying it around for a little bit and I had accumulated a fair amount of material. And then we started spending more time together and she, um, you know, was just interested in sharing some of the work with me. And so what inspired me was when she showed me the archive, you know, she showed me some of the early archival material that you know she had had access to through her father and it was like just this amazing wealth of uh material from like the late 70s early 80s kenny had a video camera at the, you know during that time which i think was kind of rare and i just saw all these crazy early videos and i was like this is this is an amazing archive you know and i think that um especially for documentary when you have access to an archive it's just, uh, it opens a lot of doors. So I just saw like this world of opportunity within the archive and, and uh, that, was, that was sort of the beginning. Like for me, that, so that was five years ago. She, she already had a lot of material beyond that too. And so we kind of stepped into it from there. Had you two worked together before? Not in that way. I mean, no, we, had we met, met on set, but it was like I was acting and you were working. Yeah, she. Was, I was helping a buddy who was making this very small little short film and she was probably helping him as well acting in it. Yeah. And then, yeah, so we, that was, that was our first meeting. So we, yeah, we've been friends for about like two years before we started to work But we've together. never worked in this way before. This is our first project together, yeah. Great. So, I, I mean, you mentioned the archival footage. Uh, I thought it was just so interesting and definitely wanted to hear more about it. Uh, the, the film, the footage from Club 57 um, of artists like, like your father and also Keith Herring and Warhol. Um, so you're saying this has been collected over a decade's time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was actually, some of it was shot by Kenny. Kenny was um, at the time making video art and, you know, shooting his friends and then other pieces of it, other, yeah, there were other moments or footage that was collected via, you know, the Warhol Foundation or the Herring Foundation and different, um, I think 
Barry Shills was someone who had a lot of archival from Club 57 specifically. So, so it's a combination, but a lot of it was also Kenny's himself. So it was great to be able to access that. Um, and then, yeah, we just, uh, you know, there was, there's always so much more to find and I'm sure there's a lot more out there that I didn't, you know, we didn't get to, but yeah. So the film focuses on New York City, 1980s. It was such an exciting time in New York. Can we talk about what the art world was like and what that meant for the artist in particular? Yeah, I mean, it's so it's interesting. I mean, that that time in New York um, is like heavily romanticized, and uh, there there's a lot of nostalgia for that time that just has carried into you know the contemporary um world that we live in today and i think i think it's for due cause you know it's like the uh, there's a certain reason behind that and i think it's connected to just what the sort of gravity of new york was in that moment where you know it just it looked very different then than it looks now and and you know it was it was a home for a lot of artists especially downtown the downtown world then was a place where you know if you were living in the US and you felt like you were a little bit of an outsider and you wanted to go and be a part of an art scene you know you moved to New York it was reasonably cheap you know especially downtown it costs like basically nothing to live there and you know and then you had this sort of like you know this figure of like Andy Warhol that was down there that you know was was Kenny's sort of um, inspiration to move there. And I think a lot of artists, you know, it was like um, Andy and the factory and just this, you know, that was like what was bringing, I think, Kenny's generation, a lot of them to New York was like Andy and the factory and this idea that they could create their own little world and this idea that, you know, you could be an artist, you know, as a painter or as a, you know, a photographer or whatever it was, but then beyond that, you could also have a persona and like create this scene, you know, and I think that that's something that we tried to capture in the film. And that is really unique to that time period, you know, like that, I think that exists in New York now still to a certain degree, but it's just, it, do, it doesn't have the same magnitude or energy that it did from that time, because it was just smaller. And now New York is just super oversaturated. And, um, you know, I think maybe you're seeing that more in smaller cities like Detroit or even Miami, you know, like, um, which is obviously growing really fast now too. But I think New York is just, it's almost like New York is done, even though there's scene stirs and there's people in New York now that are part of a little art scene and there, there's a, there's small crews there. Yeah, there's something about that time, late seventies, eighties, where it was just really unique, I think. Yeah, and also, you know, the accessibility to be an artist, to be able to create. I remember I've spoken to Kenny about this. He was like, we just made art all day and we, partied at night and like we barely had to have a job to survive so that's it's a very different scenario um you know today he, he used to work at a didn't he work at a salad he worked at a salad bar once salad bar. he worked at <laughs> yeah he danced and another thing that you kind of touched on which i think really mm -hmm. speaks to uh that time as an artist is like not needing to be one thing i'm a painter i'm a photographer but they were everything and, and that's super inspiring to me because I think you know people are multi-dimensional and there at that time there really was that that openness and that creativity and that space for that and of course that was also uh, a scene created for themselves by themselves it wasn't you know in an institution at that moment so I think those are all like the, a little bit of part of their scene at, at that time yeah in New York. Yeah, uh, it was a really exciting moment to watch. And then it kind of suddenly uh, went to another extreme, didn't it? I couldn't help watching while I was watching the film, thinking about, um, you know, so many people that recently left New York due to COVID um, and watching Kenny leave New York City, escape AIDS and the economic depression, um, but always seemed to push through and push himself in his work. Um, and then landed in Miami, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you know, what? How did that affect the work? I mean, can you talk about how those changes? Yeah, I mean, um, 
Well, you know, it was a, a very dark period um, for Kenny and his friends. And, you know, my sister and I were babies. So there was a lot of this kind of, uh, what do you call it? Not juxtaposition, but like the different um, realities of like life, having a child and then needing to uh, survive and make his work. So I think it was just, well, I think the work was very, there was a period you see in the film where you see it got darker. Um, and then, you know, Miami, Kenny's always been very inspired and connected to nature. So Miami was this place he got to feel the sunshine and go into the ocean and be surrounded by, you know, beautiful kind of jungly nature, just like that's how our house was. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think you see both of those aspects in the work of, of that it got darker for a period of time. And then also like the inspiration of the beauty and the nature and, um, I think that was, is, does that answer the question? Or do you have anything to add? <laughs> uh, no, I think, unless, yeah, Sean, I don't know if you have a follow-up, but I think that. Yeah, I think, I think I answered the question and then I'm like, <laughs> you can get carried away and forget there, if there are pieces. Well, it was nice to see that there was a, an exhibition in the design district here in Miami of Kenny's work just this last year. Um, so kind of, and, and does he still produce work here? Because I know that he was doing that for some time. So there's still that link with Miami. Oh yeah, that was another thing you touched upon is like the one thing that for me is a message in the film that I'd like, for, I hope that it inspires others um, is this, uh, you know, never giving up and this kind of strength perseverance. and perseverance and um, no matter how, you know, what comes in the road. And so, Yes, so he's still producing every day. In terms of Miami, I mean, you know, since COVID, he hasn't been traveling, but whenever he gets an opportunity to paint, specifically, I think he loves to do public, um, you know, be able to do public murals. And I know he had that amazing show. I didn't get to see it with the faces, but there will definitely be more, I think, in Miami and everywhere he can get to when things, um, settle down a little bit in terms of, yeah, COVID and the travel situation. So there have been so many um, different moments in his practice. Uh, why the film now? What does it mean for the film to exist at this time? That's a question for you. Okay. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> you know, to be honest, like we, the film kind of had a life of its own, you know, we, we've been working on it for, or I've, yeah, we've been working on it for many years. It finally got to a place, but um, it's kind of interesting that it's, so it originally, we, we got it into, it got into South by Southwest. Um, was that a year ago? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, a year ago. And then, you know, everything, the world just stopped and everything changed. And so we're able to be sharing it more now. Um, I think it's very, I think for the time, it makes a lot of sense that um, it's like, it, it is a story of perseverance, of hope, of what it means to be an artist and like the struggle and, and even the struggle in life. Um, so I think that, you know, all of what is in the film is still very relevant today. And, and then again, it's like it had a life of its own. So we didn't really control the timing of it just happened to line up now. And um, yeah, and so, and it's, it's interesting because Kenny is also at a, a point in his career and with his art that is um, also very, I don't know what you'd call it, just like he's very prolific. He's, he's definitely been more out in the public than, than ever before even so. Yeah, so there's like mysteri the, the mysterious timing makes sense and worked out. <laughs> and I think that there's a message and I think that hopefully it brings hope and uh, yeah, just like for us to be able to get through this moment and know that, you know, things are, they're always changing. You can hold on and stay true to yourself and, and try and find, you know, the beauty and what's important to you in life. Well, I mean, like, you know, just, uh, the, the title of the film, When Worlds Collide, it's yeah. right, it's like connected to the, the, the big piece that you, that, you know, we visit in the film at the Whitney. 
And then if you remember, he's talking about, you know, Malia asks him, you know, what is this, you know, what does this painting mean to you? Like, was there any like, you know, is there some sort of like meaning you can extract from this painting? And if you recall, like he, he talks about um, this idea of uh, like chaos and tranquility sort of like existing together all at the same time, which is just sort of the nature of life in general, you know, like we just, we live in a world where we're surrounded by, you know, these two elements, you know, in a constant, but now more than ever, you know, living in a pandemic a year in, you know, it feels all the more real to acknowledge this I mean, it's, it's less chaos, but it's more just, you know, I mean, just kind of, um, yeah, there's this sort of like polarity of a world that we're living in right now. And, uh, and so, yeah, so his, I think that that um, in itself is like an interesting message to be driving home right now. I mean, the other main takeaway message of the film is this idea of like connecting to like your unapologetic self, you know, being just so unapologetically who you are as an artist and your expression and connecting to like this childlike expression, which, you know, we open the film with the, the Picasso quote and then we sort of close it with this line from about like um, the importance when you get older is to sort of stay connected to like that childlike drive. And I think that's also like an interesting message for right now when the world, it just feels like we're living in like an all the more serious world where, you know, it's just, there's just like a lot of like consequences out in the world and um, it feels that way really intensely right now. So it's nice to feel reminded about the lightness of things and, and to approach, you know, the day with a sense of lightness, even, even when you're encountering hardship. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, uh, I'd love to hear about the experience of making the film. Uh, did it, you know, going in, did you have ideas of what it was going to be? Did that change along the way? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, it, you know, it was my first film and I just, I think I, I had no idea what it would take to really, you know, make a film about my father, his life, and also um, it's hard to put someone's life into a film and who's still alive and there's still so much going on. But so the film mm, had with the process, it was really challenging <laughs> and I couldn't have done it really without Max. Um, but the film kind of, we, the story began to, as we got deeper into writing the story and trying to find the structure uh, we were able to, you know, get themes of Kenny, his life, his work, and then, then the story kind of would write itself a little bit. We'd say, oh, we, we need to hear about this and we need to, you know, um, so it was a very challenging process. And um, we were basically, you know, sometimes in films, if you get really lucky and you get funding, a lot of funding, you get to have a team, which is probably really wonderful. But this whole process was really like Max and I. Um, so yeah, there, there was just like Kenny's life. It was like, it's a metaphor. There are moments of just like, I, just not knowing how to finish or what, what where the story was going. But it showed itself and we just kept at it. You know, we really just were in it to finish. And so I don't know, you might have something else to add. What would I add to that? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that a lot of the time with documentary, and again, this is like my first doc, but I've made other short docs and worked, you know, um, around people making docs. And I feel like specifically with documentary, there's like, you know, you come up against this, um, this, there's a certain friction with like what your expectation is from the beginning and what the final product is, almost just because you have so many options. And especially if you're making a film about a living person, it's like life happens, you know, and then like things take place and you thinking while you're making the film, oh, like, how can we incorporate this into the film? How can we, you know, so I think that, um, that's it's it's always like a work in progress with the doc until you're done with it and um yeah just uh so I think that there were definitely 
a lot of challenges along the way. Figuring out how to finish the film um, was one of them for sure. And, uh, but yeah, like from the beginning, yeah, it, it changed so much over the course of the years. You know, we worked on it. We worked on it pretty consistently for about two years straight. And, um, and then like after that, it was like another year and a half of literally just tweaking things and making these small adjustments and figuring out what felt like it made more sense. And then while we did really carry the burden, you know, for the most part between the two of us, we had little like, it wasn't a burden, but we carried like the weight of the project between the two of us and the weight was heavy. So it feels like a little bit like a burden because it was a big project, but um, we had some help along the way. Like, you know, we would have little screenings and get some insight from our producers and people who were helping. And, uh, you know, we had an assistant editor at one point who came on and helped a lot building out the Club 57 scene and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think it's just with docs, it's like, it's, it's an ever growing process. Whereas with narrative, it's like, you write a script, you go out, you shoot it, you get in the edit and you're like, you just line up, you know, what, what you made kind of. And then sure, maybe there's like little twists that reveal themselves, but the doc is just, there's so many options. Yeah. And uh, the, another challenge only with the amount of archival we had, it was just, we had a lot to work with. So it was like a gift and also a challenge. Yeah. Once we figured out the, like the narrative arc, then it was just a matter of seeing what we had in the archive mm -hmm. and saying like, all right, well, like this is what we can use to tell this part of the story. And this is an area where we need more material. We don't have as much in this area. We need to go out and maybe shoot some stuff and things like that. Anything you did that you'll never, you won't be doing again in your next project? <laughs> what did you learn? Hmm. Um. Like, don't make it another documentary about my family. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I don't, yeah, I mean. We learned so many things. Yeah, I mean, like, so I much. feel like the, the lessons were, you know, because we were both first time filmmakers, like feature filmmakers. So I, I think that, um, I mean, just the, like we were talking about, the process alone was such a, a learning experience. You know, like, it's not like we had, you know, a book that was, you know, and we could have probably read a book that was like, here's how you make a documentary film. But like, you know, we were more just kind of making it happen and figuring out what made sense. And um, yeah, and so like, so that sort of trial and error learning process, I think we both absorbed a lot and, and uh, definitely would carry all that knowledge into the next project. And yeah. something I wouldn't do again though, like, I don't know. Um, We'd organize our archive. Everything would be better organized. I don't know. <laughs> it was it was a lot of different stuff. It was a challenging. I wouldn't so, say I wouldn't say any like not one thing I wouldn't do again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it sounds like you were doing the job of many people and and pulled it off. So congratulations for that. Um, in addition to all of the archival footage, there were. You know, a number of really interesting interviews from Jeffrey Deitch, Yoko Ono, Marilyn Minter. Can you talk a little bit about um, the experience of, of interviewing these you know, important presences in the art world? Yeah, Malia had, had something in the oven, so she had to go turn it off. Um, <laughs> she's got multiple things in ovens. Uh, <laughs> what the, so interviewing different artists, I mean, that was super cool for me. I mean, um, I wasn't there for some of those interviews, actually, interestingly enough. I was there for the Marilyn Minter interview because Malia had done a lot of interviews before I got involved in the project. That was like, you know, cause she'd been doing it for five years before I stepped in. So she had a lot of interviews and then we together interviewed some people. Um, I wasn't there for the Jeffrey interview, the, the Marilyn interview, I mean, she, remind me of the question. She was just such a special, person, Marilyn. She's like, just so cool. And I feel like all the interviews I was there for, at least all the artists were um, really just humble. And um, it was it was such a, a joy to be able to spend time with them and for them to give their time to him really, you know, and to trust us, you know, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I feel like it's rare. It's, it's like, it would be fun to go back and interview them about 
their work too because <laughs> you know they they have so much to say about someone else and more and like a lot more to say about themselves too i feel like for an artist but yeah, i don't know what would you say about your experience with the interviews with the artists and the various people um i mean also along the years as i got more you know as i grew older and got more confident you know i had been doing it over time and i started when i was 20 um and so yeah, I think for me, thinking back, I'm like, oh, I, I, yeah, in terms of like confidence, maturity, I, I loved interviewing them. Many of them I, I knew personally, probably through, through my father. And so, yeah, I just felt it was a gift to be able to have time with them. And that's something I would do differently is I, I mean, now that I'm older, it would just be a different experience <laughs> being able to talk to them, but um, it was really fun. Yeah. I loved Marilyn Monroe was such a fun, like so inspiring because a lot of sometimes what these artists are sharing, even though you said it's not necessarily about their work, it is their point of view, you know, and you hear a little bit of how they view the world and how the, their experience of, of being an artist. So um yeah yeah one thing that we at least the interviews i did with the, some of the artists um we interviewed like one, one question that i think was interesting to get a perspective on and that we talk about a fair amount in the film is just this idea of you know art for everyone versus art for the few and this is something that in the film we really tried to make um, clear about Kenny and his cohorts at the time, like Keith and, and Jean-Michel and, and multiple other, you know, artists during that era, there was this movement to make art accessible and to, and part of that what mission wasn't bringing art in the streets, you know, and, and, uh, and obviously that whole movement has exploded um, in the last 30 years or 40 years or whatever, but um, this is a question that I think is interesting for artists to talk about because it's something I think if you're an artist, you're really hyper aware of. And mm -hmm. it's just this idea of currency and this idea of, um, you know, making your art accessible because, you know, I think that the way that the market works in general is, you know, when there's an excess of something, it's usually um, more affordable or, you know, it's just, just sort of like um, this idea of, uh, what is it, like what demand and, uh, supply and demand. yeah, supply and demand. I don't know. So I feel like talking to artists about that, about making art for everyone and hearing their perspectives on that um, was something that each artist had a kind of unique perspective on. And um, I think that was interesting, yeah. I thought even the way that Kenny was sharing and speaking uh, over the course of the film was itself so generous and, and reflective of, of his practice and the way he was. And it was really nice to, you kind of felt that uh, throughout. Um, Malia, uh -huh. I have to ask, I mean, you're, you, you lived with this man that was working and working mm -hmm. and working. How, how did that, you know, affect the way that you're working as an artist now? Um, you know, were you, think, were you a maker and a creator from a young age? Um, yeah, I mean, Kenny is very, uh, you know, it's definitely very inspiring, but he is really one of a kind. I, I, I won't, I can't say that I don't, I don't have that kind of work ethic. And I mean, I have my hands in many different, like I'm a different type of creative artist that I'm interested in many, many different things. I don't have just this one um, pointed kind of focus and drive the way he does with his painting. It's like, it, it, you know, I think Robert Williams says like, he's compulsive. He's just completely compulsive or something. And like- He uses an explicit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he does. And, you know, it's so living, it, you know, it's a lot to live up to kind of when you see a figure like that. But, um, you know, also as I get older, I realize oh, everyone does things in different ways. But yeah, he's definitely one of a kind. And truthfully, um, I have not ever met any other, well, I've never, I have not had another father like him, but in general, just the people I've met in my life, I've, I, the, the, the kind of work ethic and the drive and like this constant need uh, to create in the way that he does is, is um, it's quite rare and special. And that's, 
that's totally him. I, I can't say that I necessarily picked it up, but you know, my, I think the way that I look at art and beauty and uh, you know, I was just raised with it. So I got to, it, it's, it's a part of my life and it's sometimes it's maybe something I don't even realize I could take for granted, but um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so living with him was it's just like living with a kind of like a madman slash genius. And I mean, he would paint on everything. And when I was younger, that would bother me. I didn't like it. I wanted to be like other kids in my school and it was just not normal. But now I, I fully embrace and appreciate that. Um, yeah. It's a good question. What was that? So it's a good question. Thank you. Um, are there any other, you know, themes of the film or about anecdotes about making the film that you want to share that I haven't asked today? Hmm. It's not easy to make independent films. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like, <clears throat> like Malia was saying, you know, um, it's interesting. I mean, Kenny, Kenny's doing really, really well right now and he's done you know, really well, obviously at, at multiple different sort of um, points in his career. He's also, you know, struggled at certain points in his career. And I feel like the film, it's almost emblematic of the way that the life of the film is now having. It's like the film has had success and then it's like having like, it's just, it's, you know, also just releasing a film during COVID. It's like, you know, there's, it was like, a big build up to like a multiple different little moments of disappointment that are now having again like these little surges where there's like exciting elements that take place within it and so it's like a roller coaster i mean making an independent film um or i mean I, i'm sure with any film but with independent cinema you know i mean it's just uh yeah you, it's not for the lighthearted. <laughs> you yeah, have to actually be. talk about like that perseverance i mean you have if you want to make something and you're kind of going off on your own, you really gotta push through. So I'll take that back about my work ethic being like, we made this and it, we just stuck to it no matter how long it took. So um, yeah, I, yeah, what else? Is there something else I wanted to share about? Anecdotes? I mean, yeah, no, nothing like specifically, just um, spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that we really, or I, I feel like I, I am missing in this time is, is hearing feedback, is getting to um, experience people's experience of the film. And, you know, we, we would have had that um, at, at South By or even coming to this festival. Or, um, and so that, that it takes a little bit away from just the interaction and like, how does this inspire someone or how does it move them or touch them? Um, that would be like my, that's not really about the film, but it's maybe about this experience in this time. So I always encourage people to reach out to us somehow, I don't know, Instagram, email, and just tell us if it inspired you because, or what it did for you. Cause um, that was a big part of making this as well as like wanting to spread that and, and yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it, I kudos to you, both of you for you know seeing through the project and pouring yourselves into it. Um, yeah, this is this is a moment where you know everyone asks, will technology um, take over our real world experience? And no, because we need the art to be around us and surround us and and connect us in that way. So definitely feel you and and hope that I'm sure there will be opportunities to screen. Uh, with large groups in the future. Uh, so I'll just ask one more question. Um, how, you know, what does it mean to be part of the Jewish Film Festival with this film? Yeah, I mean. I think it's it's super, I mean, look, I mean, yeah, we're. It's inspiring. Yeah. I love that it's reaching, you know, I mean, my father's Jewish, so I'm Jewish I, and. Yeah, technically. Well, <laughs> technically you know, not. No, I feel, you know, it's where we we both grew up actually in like Jewish households, you know. So um even though parent. even though like, you know, both of our your mother converted to Judaism. That's a whole other story that would be really interesting <laughs> another time, but <laughs> my mother technically 
um, did not convert to Judaism, but my father grew up in a Jewish household and, and, and we always um, celebrated Jewish holidays growing up. And so, I mean, I just think it's, um, I think it's a beautiful thing that we're connecting, you know, um, to the Jewish Film Festival in Miami. And, um, you know, we're, I think that it's like, it's, it's interesting too, because, because Kenny also, you know, is, is definitely a Jewish artist, you know, and um, there's something beautiful about, about connecting to that lineage and, and celebrating that here through the festival. Yeah, it's an honor. Great. Well, thank you both so much for your time today, um, for joining us to speak about your wonderful film, Kenny Scharf, When Worlds Collide. Congratulations. Uh, thank you to all the members, sponsors, community partners, volunteers, and all of you film lovers. See how important you are to letting our directors and creatives know how much we appreciate them. Uh, and thanks to the sponsors, Center of the Advancement of Jewish Education and Greater Miami Jewish Federation. Um, thank you for participating in the 24th Annual Miami Jewish Film Festival. <laughs>